Good morning and welcome. On behalf of Microsoft and Seismic and Advertising Age, I want to welcome you to this very special event. Uh, we're, we're extremely excited about what you're going to see today. My name is Daryl McDade, and I am from Microsoft. I work for the developer and platform evangelism team at Microsoft. And in particular, my team works with uh, the largest websites, brand marketers, and advertisers, and agencies in the world uh, to do great things on Microsoft technology. Uh, and also, we work with uh, a lot of the folks in social media, uh, and in particular, uh, Twitter and solutions around Twitter. So, I wanted to take some time to give you a sort of a preview uh, of what you're going to see here and tell you sort of how we got here. So about a year ago, our team began working with Seismic uh, through a program called BizSpark. And during those interactions and uh, all the time that we spent with the Seismic team, we were super impressed by the team. And we always knew they were going to be doing great things. And one of the reasons that we are particularly excited about this event is you're going to see a tremendous innovation that the team is going to deliver, and we are a proud partner with them in that venture. So as you walked in, you probably saw these, these signs or mention of this, the phenomenon begins now. And I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, really? Now? Hasn't the Twitter phenomenon already begun? Well, to demystify that a little bit, it's a, it's a thought-provoking message that we wanted to sort of start things off with. While Twitter is huge, there's no denying that. I think the last number that I saw was something like 25 million users. If you look at that against, though, say, the potential users against all Internet users, we think there's a tremendous potential there to be unlocked. And I think that the innovation that you're going to see unveiled here today will You'll, you'll, I think you'll agree with me by the end that there's a lot of potential energy that can be unleashed there. One of the key themes that I think that you'll see is how brand marketers and advertisers can leverage Twitter and how that will be a key lever. It already has been a key lever in unlocking the potential of Twitter, but how that can even go to, a, to the next level. And I think that that's one of the things that you'll see with this innovation here, how that can actually happen. And with those brand marketers and advertisers, whether they are leveraging something like Twitter for, say, proactive uh, outreach to consumers, uh, reactive technical support, uh, whether it's around directly connecting with people on a social level with the personalities behind the brand, whether it's you know, timely promotions, or uh, delivering information, uh, inspiring people through thought leadership, or even crowdsourcing ideas from the community, right? There's several opportunities for brands, and I think that there's gonna be a great intersection between what you'll see with the, um, the, the unveiling with the Seismic product and these, these goals around media and brands. In particular, when you think about those content types that, we just, that I just talked about, and you bring those things together with the qualities of not only Twitter and the platform that it provides or any social media platform, and you bring those things together with the brand values and a tremendous user experience, I think that's where the impact of social media can be realized. And so with that, I want to give you an idea what the lineup here is going to be along those themes. So first, we'll hear from Shiv Singh, who's a VP at Razorfish. Uh, we'll then have Loic do the unveiling of the product. And then we'll have Steve Rubel close us out with some practical insights from marketers, sort of in the context of what you've just seen. So now with that, I want to invite our first speaker, uh, Shiv Singh. He's a VP and global social media lead at Razorfish. He is also the author of Social Media Marketing for Dummies. Uh, Shiv, please join me on stage. So what I thought I would do today is start with a presentation. Um, anyway, I'll get started, and I think the presentation will catch up. 
Um, what I thought I'd do this morning is, is just share some, some big trends that I'm seeing for social media and social media marketing in 2010 um, and, and sort of frame up the Twitter phenomena for you. Um, these are trends and things that I worry about every day that I advise uh, my clients, which are you know the Fortune 500s, about what to think about when they think through social media. But firstly, I'd like to start with this quote because to me it's always very important and it centers everything uh, that I do and many of the things that are done in my agency. And it's from Peter Drucker and he said, the purpose of a business is to create a customer. And I really love that quote because it, it encapsulates so much in one sentence. You know, all of us in this room, all of our clients, um, everyone is in the business of creating customers. Um, Peter Drucker, who was you know, the greatest management uh, thinker who ever lived, uh, unfortunately died a few years ago, sort of right before this whole social media phenomena. Um, I'd like to humbly suggest, though, that if he were around today, he would probably have revisited this quote of his, this ever so classic quote, and instead he would be saying something like this instead. The purpose of a business is to create a customer who creates customers for you. As we look at this whole social media phenomena through the lens of marketing, through the lens of business, where it provides the most amazing value is it allows your customers to create customers for you. And you know, whenever you think about social media, whenever you think about Twitter, whenever you think about anything that you're hearing today, think about it through this lens because it does come down to the fact that customers can create customers for you. It also means something else, though, which is gets a little tricky. And it leaves your job to be only taking care of your existing customers, which at first we might think is easier, but it actually is a lot harder than you realize. So what I believe, as we enter 2010 and even beyond, more and more brands are going to pay a lot more attention to nurturing their existing customer bases and using those customers to create new customers for them. And in a sense, that they can do thanks to the social phenomena. So as we get into these five trends, I just wanted to share this snippet. So uh, trend number one, social influence marketing enters the mainstream. And you're going to hear why I talk about social influence marketing. So you know, for a long time, there were really two pillars of marketing, brand and direct response. Brand was all about crafting a very strong message, really building up your brand, and then pushing it out through advertising in all the different channels and now platforms and tweaking it and optimizing it, but it was one-way top-down communication. Then you had direct response, you know, which came about and, and was an amazing results-driven uh, form of marketing where you'd send a message to one specific person and get a very specific response back. It's worked extremely well for the last you know, couple of decades it'll probably work extremely well into the future for the next few decades. But in the last few years, we've seen the rise of social media. And I believe that it's resulting in, in a brand new dimension of marketing. And to really leverage it and harness it, you need to be able to put the brand and the direct marketing sides, yes, oh, they're this side, to one side and focus on social influence marketing. It doesn't take away from those two, it enhances them. And here's what I mean by social influence marketing, really leveraging social media. First and foremost, it means allowing the community to shape and evolve your brand for you. You know, this, this is the, the type of subject or the type of line that it's very easy to throw up on a slide deck and say, you have to do this. But it's, of course, much harder, and it's, 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 it's also a, a very complex decision. But to operate and succeed in this world, not only can a brand need to open up to its customers, but it needs to let them take ownership of the brand as well. And social influence marketing does that. That's what it's about. It also means marketing to the community and not just the individual. For a long time, we've always thought about marketing as reaching one person in isolation. In fact, if you were to go to Amazon and look up all books on marketing, nine out of 10 of them will talk about the customer in the singular, never about customers acting together. It's always, always about the customer in isolation. What we've seen with the social media phenomena and very much with Twitter is 
people come together as groups, they act as groups, and then they move away and then form other communities, act you know, together, and dissipate again. It's important for marketers to think in terms of knowing when the customers are coming together as groups, making decisions as a group, marketing to them as a group, and then letting go of those marketing efforts as they move away. And that's something that's getting uh, really important. And the person who's really done some amazing thinking in this realm is uh, actually Seth Godin. And I feel credit is uh, due where it's deserved. And it's all about focusing on uh, the community and not the, just the individual. Another key piece of this is uh, using technology to bring you closer to your customers, not further. So you know, I've been in this business for 14, 15 years. Um, and it's very interesting. In the last 14 and 15 years, say for the last three, we've been creating technologies that have separated us further and further from our customers. It started with radio, then it was TV, then it was you know, the web, the fancy websites, and it kept going on and on. Now the mobile phones. And all of a sudden, when we look at brands, we've suddenly realized, wait a minute, we've been doing things that have made it harder for us to connect with our customers. What the social phenomena does is lets you bring yourself a lot closer to those customers. And that's something that we need to really focus on. Tied to that is the notion of when you think about digital, forget about your fancy website. Yes, it is important. It'll always be important. But those product pages that you've usability tested to death, they matter, but not as much as they once did. You have to focus on social influence. Now, you know, I'd like to pause just for a minute. You might have noticed I've been talking about social influence marketing versus social media marketing. And the reason is very simple. When we talk about social media and social media marketing, we invariably tend to focus on the platforms, you know, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whoever it may be. But what's interesting is the real change is, have the, is happening at a higher level around the relationships and around how people are influencing each other. And that's why I prefer to use the newer term, social influence marketing. So that's the last one now, bring on the social graph, bring in the social graph and not the customer. So just as you need to market to the community, whenever you do something with your customer, you need to bring uh, his or her social graph in as well. So those are some of the things to think about as we look at practicing social influence marketing. Um, just one or two quick examples on this trend. Um, this is from Mattel. Um, Barbie, as you may or may not know, celebrated her 50th birthday uh, just last year, late last year. It was a wonderful event. Um, but they also faced a very interesting cha challenge in that they saw it as an opportunity to really market and showcase you know, Barbie and how she's changed many of our lives. Not all of us necessarily, but many of us. Um, but at the same time, they were a little queasy about the fact that here is an icon who's all about youth, four teenagers, and she's turning 50. And the other problem that they faced was that for once, they had no TV budget. They couldn't advertise on TV. They had a very small print budget. It was 2009, the, the second Great Recession. What they did instead, though, was they combined social media with PR and events, and that the whole marketing campaign was around these three things. And they gave Barbie a social voice, a voice that made her certainly not appear as a 50-year-old, but more like you know, the, the teenage icon that she's always been. She had a huge presence on the social platforms. And for the first time in the history of Barbie, she, she was speaking to, to her fans anywhere and everywhere. And she was at events, and there was all this PR around it. It was, it was a, a landmark campaign because it didn't depend on any of the traditional mechanisms of marketing and use social media at its core, giving Barbie a voice. Um, it actually resulted in a 22% sales increase in uh, the last quarter of 2009 because it was so social media driven, because it focused on social influence and all those relationships. Um, the other thing that I want to just mention around this trend, and we're going to see a lot more of this, some of you may have seen this advertising age story that uh, Pepsi, for the first time in a long time, has decided not to advertise on the Super Bowl. You know, that's a huge thing. This, this, the advertising 
on the Super Bowl has always been the, the in a sense, the, the pinnacle of all advertising. But instead, they're going to use all that money and more money to run this massive social media effort to engage with consumers around, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations and good causes, and it's just launching. What's interesting about this is, well, there are two things. One is they're dropping the Super Bowl advertising. They feel they don't need it. But the second is they're realizing that they don't need to build awareness through, uh, through a Super Bowl ad anymore. It's not about building awareness for them. It's about more deeply engaging with their customers. It's about taking care of their existing customers, showing them that you know, they're great corporate citizens and helping them do things that they want to. And that's why they're leveraging and using social media so much. So we're going to see a lot more of this in 2010 and moving forward too. So trend number two, social influencers drive sales. Um, this is probably one of my favorite ones. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we love talking about all these platforms. And there are many more that are going to come. Granted, there are a few that uh, are extra special than others, one you're going to hear about today. But there are also a lot of platforms there. The smartest and the most successful entrepreneurs and, and uh, businessmen behind these platforms are the ones who recognize that the real stories is not at the platform level, it's at the relationship level. And uh, you know, as you think about everything today, think about what it's doing for people to engage with each other and with brands. It's not as much about the technology. The technologies behind anything and everything practically in the social media phenomena are, are, are relatively simple and straightforward uh, compared to you know, other technologies that we see. It is about the relationships. Um, the reason why we also know it's about the relationships is um, because 72% of internet users say um, that they're exposed to too much advertising. And when it comes to who they trust, it's the recommendations from people they know. So when you think about social media and you think about its potential, think about it in terms of it's allowing a lot more people to make recommendations to each other in real time across the web as they're making purchasing and brand affinity decisions. And that's a phenomenal thing about social media. And that's why my clients and big brands across the country and across the globe are so excited about it. It also means, though, that you can't just be focusing on all those traditional influencers. So when I talk about social influencers driving sales, I'm going to try and do something fancy and point. So as I hinted at earlier, for a long time, we just focus on the customer and not on the customers around him or her. The other people we need to focus on are the key influencers. So arguably, we've been focusing on the key influencers. Some of you are the key influencers, you know, members of the press who have very large audiences and large publishing platforms. Um, they matter. They'll always really matter. But there are also two other groups that, by and large, we've ignored in marketing for a long time. The first are the social influencers. And probably the best way to describe this group is um, for me to go back to high school. And I'm, I always sort of feel a tinge of embarrassment when I say this. But um, So I was in a class of 300 kids. Of the 300 kids, there were five kids who were the cool kids. Whatever they did, the other 295 of us wanted to do. The way they dressed, the movies they watched, um, you know, the music they listened to, anything and everything they did, we wanted to do. In all of our social circles, whether we like to admit it or not, we have those cool kids. The interesting thing is, they play a massive role on influence and purchasing decisions. Um, there are a few theorists like Duncan Watts who've done a lot of great research to show how important they are. What's interesting is we've ignored this group. We've never known how to market to them. But now, thanks to the social phenomena, because we know they're on Twitter, because we know that they have X number of followers and X, Y, Z pass along effect when they do something, we can reach them. They're really important. The third group are the peer influencers. The best way to think about these are as, as friends and family, your inner circle when you're actually making a purchasing decision. We ignore this group in marketing and have for the, for the most part. Not always, but we certainly haven't given them enough attention. They're another opportunity. So for example, when you look at a product page on a website, 
there's no reason why it can't allow direct social shopping so that you know, when I'm going to buy a sofa, I can be on that page with my wife even though she's in her own office in front of her own computer because at the end of the day, you know, she makes the decision and not I do, so might as well have, be looking at that with me. But that's an example of, of social, of peer influencers, and it's important to know who they are. Um, this is just one example of, of a social influencer. How many of you are familiar with Melanie and Savvy Auntie? It's roughly a third uh, of the room. Um, so she started a website uh, uh, called Savvy Auntie, and it's for all aunties in the world. Um, and what's so phenomenal about it is they bring them together, and she, in a sense, has become a voice for all the aunties. She is very much a key influencer. When Disney was trying to reach uh, moms and their aunts, they came to her for help. And these are sort of the new uh, uh, advertising platforms Maybe not as large as, as you know, a mainstream publication, maybe not for a very long time, but they increasingly matter a lot. Um, and this is just to give you a sense on Twitter, some of the other uh, new personal brands who matter a lot when we're marketing and advertising. The point being is that as we look at microblogging, as we look at the way social influence takes place, we have a lot of new uh, influences that we need to think about constantly and brands need to know how to engage with them and reach their consumers to them. It also means that brands need to look at new ways of reaching their consumers. So that brings me to trend number three, putting people before brands. And I say this a little tongue in cheek, because for a long time we've always thought through the lens of putting brands before people, but it's time to sort of flip that. And what that means is by developing social voices or social influence uh, marketing voices. So we've already, always had strong brands, you know, with strong brand voices behind them. And the best way to think of them is, uh, you know, you'd have your singular company voice. It reflects the brand personality very well. Everybody follows a brand voice, appears on all brand touch points. It's usually unique to the company. It's sometimes manifested in a person, but not always. And it's used everywhere from signage to ads. You look at any major brand, and you see this reflected. They have perfect brand voices. And from their TV ads, to print, to digital, to events, you know their brands. And it's, it's sort of one of the most important or traditional things around brands is you've got to have your perfect brand, and you have all your style guides, and you have everything to make sure that no one messes with your brand, in a sense. That's worked amazingly well for all the other forms of marketing and all the other channels um, and platforms. It doesn't work well for the social web because, most importantly, brands are anonymous. They're not real people. The fundamentals of the social phenomena is about people talking to each other. And what that means is, Across the social web, the brands that succeed, um, not just in 2010, but further out as well, will be the ones that develop strong social voices. And even now, the brands that we do see as succeeding are the ones that have very strong social voices. So what are those social voices? They're multiple authentic individual voices representing the brand. They're transparent and searchable. They're engaging and conversational. They're real people talking on behalf of the brand. They appear where the conversations are versus trying to pull the consumers somewhere. They're unique to the person, not the company. They're manifested in real people. And they're used only by real people. This is another slide where it's sort of easy to put up there and say, you know, we all need to do this. We all need to think about this. But arguably, it's extremely hard when you're talking about a Chanel or a Victoria's Secret or a Mercedes-Benz. Some brands like Ford and Comcast have suddenly gone a lot further in this direction. We're going to see a lot more of this because to engage with consumers in the social web, it has to be real people to real people. One company that's been doing this very successfully, um, I like to believe, is Best Buy. So they started like this. For a long time, all their marketing and all their advertising looked like this. It was pretty much traditional. That's a print example. That's a digital example. You know, it, it, it was straightforward. It helped them sell. But it, it, was, it didn't work, certainly, for a web and digital that was increasingly going social. 
Then a few years ago, their CMO, Barry Judge, and his team started dabbling in social media. And we started to see pages like this appear. Barry started his own blog. He got active on Twitter. He asked his core social team to do a lot more on Twitter. And slowly, they started to build up a following and sort of told the world that, wait a minute, we're out here on Twitter. Um, behind this big Best Buy brand, there are a lot of social voices who can help you. Then, and this is more recently, just as in the last uh, eight, nine months, they decided to take it even one step further, where they moved their whole brand to being a social brand. Um, if you've seen the 12 Force uh, advertisements on television, or if you've been to twitter.com slash 12 Force, you'll know what I'm talking about. They've made all their employees and all their retail outlets across the country the faces of their brand. Individual, multiple, authentic voices representing themselves to consumers in the real world and in the social web as well. In a sense, they're putting people before the brand. And as we look at the evolution of brands, it doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but certainly to the more consumer-centric brands, they're moving along this continuum from having very strong brand voices to developing social voices to evolving the brands to the point where they're becoming, in a sense, social brands. And, and I think you know, later this morning, you'll hear more about this and the opportunities uh, as to, to think in terms of social brands. It also means, the last piece around this is, you need to move away from thinking in terms of your brand is this amazing halo or this amazing thing with uh, the community on the fringe around it. Rather, it's reverse now. The community is at the center, and the brand is on the fringe. Or not on the fringe. That's a little unfair to the brands, maybe. But it surrounds the customers and the community. So trend number four, every decision becomes social. What I mean by this is it starts with this number. Can anyone guess what this is, this 3 million, what it represents? These are the number of tweets that take place in a single day. Now, I spend my days and my nights and sometimes too many weekends advising marketers on how to engage with the social web. And the first question they always ask is, what are people talking about? What's going on? And what's interesting is a lot more of these conversations than we realize are about people influencing each other around purchasing and brand affinity decisions. Um, let me give you an example from the auto industry. Um, um, this is a 2010 Ford Mustang for, for the car enthusiasts in the room. Um, we know for a fact, and there's great research to show this, that 20% of car recommendations by influencers are followed. 20%, that's an incredibly high number. And when we look at it by category, uh, recommended their friend to purchase their purchase to a friend in the auto category, we had 67%. And at least one friend purchased the recommended brand. Um, that happened 14% of the time. The point is, even with decisions as big as cars, people talk about what they're buying. They ask each other for advice, and they influence each other. Um, it also shows that new cars are always a great conversation topic. In fact, you know, when we look at connected consumers, we'll tell 20 people on average about you know, what they've bought um, in the auto industry. A single consumer is telling 20 others what they bought. Those are the kinds of conversations that are happening online. That's why we say that every decision is becoming social, because these are the things that people are talking about. Also interestingly, brand conversations are increasing online. One in 10 adults is using social networks to share information about products. I'm willing to bet that by the end of 2010, from 1 in 10, it'll be 4 in 10, or maybe even 5 in 10. And 20% of consumers are very likely or um, likely to have an online interaction with, uh, with a car manufacturer. So the consumers aren't just influencing each other and talking to each other about what products to buy, but they're also talking to the brands. And we're going to see a lot more of that in the future as well. Um, these are very big trends. So the takeaway from that is you're never going to buy a car alone. You're always going to be doing it with your friends, with your peers, and also talking to that car manufacturer, 
even with decisions that may be 20, 30, who knows, $40,000 purchases. So the last trend, measuring it all. This is, uh, I put it last because I know with, when I talk about measurement, I lose half the audience and the other half really wakes up. And, and I don't want to lose half the audience too early on, so I keep it at the end. Um, something that uh, uh, my company introduced was the SIM score. And this is a, think of this as sort of the blood pressure for the social web, for, for brands on the social web. It, it learns uh, a lot from the net promoter score and follows that. And it's an index score looking at your conversation market share, uh, adjusted for sentiment and adjusted for influence as well. What's interesting is we're seeing a lot of brands uh, manage their SIM score on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, comparing it to their direct competitors, because that shows the strength of their brand in the social web, and it's getting more and more important. In fact, Forrester just highlighted this as uh, a top item for 2010 in terms of what brands are going to do. Um, to give you an example, these are SIM scores from the financial services space. Why does this matter? As brands look to use Twitter and, and engage with consumers, and as consumers engage with each other about brands and products and purchasing decisions, um, it's important to have a few key metrics to know the health of your brand always, especially when you know, phenomena explode on Twitter or crises explode, whatever it may be. You want to look at how your brand is doing on an ongoing basis. Um, this is an example. I mean, I really made this measurement section boring. I'm going from financial services banks to now talking about mutual funds. Um, but this is an example of you know, five or six mutual funds, how their SIM scores track over time. And it's interesting to see that sharp drop in fidelity. It was tied to the fact that they, uh, I think, announced their quarterly earnings. And it had a huge ripple effect across the social web. What we are also starting to see in some cases is the SIM scores serve as a leading indicator for sales as well, sales with electronic uh, companies, but certainly in terms of you know, uh, broader marketing metrics as well, brand health ones. So it's getting increasingly important. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I thought I would highlight, as we look at the evolution of social uh, marketing, you know, it sort of started there with experiments, what I like to call the nephew test, where we all thought that, oh, you know, the social media thing, we don't need to hire anyone to do that. We don't need to do it ourselves. The nephew can take care of it. It's sort of like with digital back in uh, 1994. Then there was the rush to the, to the platforms. Every brand felt they needed to do something on the social platforms. Then, and I think this is probably the stage where most brands are at, they're on all the platforms, but they're not quite sure what to do. They have some fans, they have some followers, they're using it to promote their products, they're testing out reviews, uh, they're trying to start conversations, but they're sort of having mixed success. The next stages, I feel, is when brands become more of social brands with those social voices in a similar fashion to the way uh, Best Buy has done. After that, I see, and it's sort of happening concurrently to is brands become real-time. They recognize that they live in a real-time world, their marketing needs to be more real-time, their products need to be more real-time, and they have to be there. And that'll happen, you know, one could argue that's already happening with Twitter, but um, I think we need to see a little more people on Twitter for, for that to, for brands who really focus on it completely in terms of changing the organization around it. And then the last stage will be is when everything for the brands become around the communities on the social platforms. We're not there yet, but we're going to get there soon. So that's it, uh, five trends for social influence marketing. We see it entering the mainstream. We see social influencers driving sales, so definitely focus on them a lot, understand them. We see the importance of putting people before brands versus brands before people. I feel every decision is going to become a social one. Uh, for everyone in this country, and measuring is uh, going to get even more and more important. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks, Shiv. And with that, I think we're all really excited to now see the unveiling that Seismic has for us today. So without further ado, Loic. 
Thank you, Daryl. Um, welcome, everyone, again. And uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, coming in this room in person in New York, because this event was announced um, a little bit more than 24 hours ago. And, uh, and so that's, you know, the social media, media in action uh, right here. So I know um, a few of uh, many friends are watching also, but I especially would like to thank you here in the room, obviously, for making it, taking the time in your busy uh, schedules. Um, and with that, I would like also to uh, obviously thank Microsoft uh, being an awesome partner. And we are thrilled uh, today to um, unveil Sismic Look, which um, is the result of, uh, of a collaboration between uh, Sismic and, uh, and Microsoft. And before, I, before I, uh, I, I launch it, I would like to, uh, to just give you a little background about it uh, very quickly. We, Sismic, have been in the uh, Twitter ecosystem as, 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 um, as I have been myself as well for, uh, for a little while. And um, we have um, a number of products available for um, platforms, uh, which are uh, obviously desktop, Sismic for Windows, Sismic Desktop. For the web, we have uh, Sismic Web, entirely web-based, nothing to install uh, for those of you who like that. Um, we have also mobile products, which, uh, which are doing pretty well. And uh, we will keep increasing the number of products. The vision of Sismic is to help you share on social software, regardless of where you are. And uh, we went one step further recently acquiring our friends at Ping FM, who are now full-time working with Sismic, to have two more screens, if I may say so, email, text message, and even chat, which I, I really like myself. It's actually too easy to share with, with chat. And so everywhere you can be, we can be on any phone, for example, with email and chat already, and sharing everywhere you should be, since if it's important for you, for your brand, to. Uh, uh, to, to share. We want you to, to be able to do that very easily on, uh, on a number of social networks. But that's not the point today. The point today, and the reason why I was you know, explaining why, what is our current offering with 3.5 million downloads and uh, combined with Ping FM about a million users, is um, that we started to think with Microsoft a few, you know, a good number of months ago, that those products may not be the right ones for people in the street, for people watching CNN, uh, and who you know, are, are hearing about Twitter all day long, all day long, on Oprah. And those, you know, like, quote, unquote, normal <laughs> mainstream people, I don't, you know, not that we're not normal, but they're not, like, they, they don't know what a hashtag is. They will never know what a hashtag is, I think. They, uh, they, they don't know what RSS is, and they will probably not know what it is either for a while. So those, I think the rest uh, of us coming to Twitter, we, we, we see a lot, a huge growth. There was a, a number, a number of posts posted uh, recently that the Twitter ecosystem would be, I don't know, you ask Twitter, but three to four times more than the users on Twitter.com, and we see very nice growth on Sismic uh, tools. And we think this has only begun. This is really the beginning of tens of millions of users who are discovering Twitter right now who are not uh, power users. And power users will still be there, obviously, and we will keep innovating. But we had to, it was our duty to make a, create a product which was for them, uh, for my mother, that frankly cannot use Sismic Desktop. It's a little complicated. That's the, uh, the whole idea. So the first thing we wanted to remove was you know, all the difficult points, and the first one is having a Twitter account. Ask anyone in the street, not all of them have Twitter accounts. And so that's like, when you think about it, it's, it's very easy to say. And we had this conversation with a team at, at Twitter who has been very helpful. Um, but if you think about it, you cannot launch a Twitter client without a Twitter account. That makes sense. But if you want them to start using it, well, you should fix that. And we fixed it. So let me announce now um, and, and, and make the first demo of uh, Sismic Look. Um, and um, so here we go. So when you launch Sismic Look, you have, um, you have on the screen a new experience, which we are very happy to present to you today. 
And this is working when you're logged out. You don't need a Twitter account to use it. And so as it happens, it happens instantly on trends. So you're very familiar with trends. Um, and you can see what people are talking about right now, like Haiti and other from, other, from several sources, obviously. And also in terms of UI, you, uh, you, you can notice as well that, the, uh, uh, that Seismic Look has, um, is extremely simple. We wanted it very, very, very pure uh, without you know, tons of options in front of you um, and, uh, and go straight to the information. So here is you know, the first thing you see. And you can obviously uh, watch the, um, uh, the trends by day, by week. So now, as you can see, I'm uh, going into uh, more like a timeline, timeline mode, which is familiar to you. I can uh, um, navigate it um, uh, very easily, and it's, uh, it's easy to, to read. Um, one of the things that, that might be interesting is if you go to, um, for example, this trend, you will see the timeline, so that's, uh, that's uh, about Haiti. And if you click on this user, so I'm doing it uh, completely random. This is obviously live information. You can see that the background of the app, well, it happens to be a, a, a blue background, changes into that user background. So if I go to, um, let's say, this one, So we made the app really feel like more like a, you know, a game experience, something very, very easy to use. As you can see also, I'm not sure about the live stream, how you see it, but the, uh, uh, it's the same. The background has changed into, uh, into this one. And so we made it very uh, um, interactive and, uh, and very rich, something, you, something that is difficult to do if you do it web-based, obviously. So this is all, um, so Seismic Look is all native. Uh, Windows and available for uh, all Windows products, obviously optimized for Windows 7, but also available for and works on Vista and XP. And um, you now, if, as we navigate on it, on the left navigation, you can see we have an uh, interest. And in interest, we try to solve the second like, pain point, the second issue that we have noticed with uh, mainstream users is that they need to be in an environment where they trust the brands. They, they find people they know. And the, the, the sources they trust, the sources they read, uh, or they really like, might not be the same as ours, ours, the power users. And so we selected the number of news. This is all curated uh, uh, manually um, and selected. So as you can see on the left, we have CNN, BBC, the Huffington Post, New York Times. And you can either watch the news. I like this term of, I, I think we help watching Twitter. And you don't have to be active in front of uh, Seismic Look. You can just watch it. You can always go back to what I like to call, I know my team doesn't like me to call it this way, but you see on the top right, the little button, which is a TV. Um, and uh, so this mode, uh, is called in the app a playback mode, mode in Seismic Look. If you click on it, I like to call it the TV mode, but that's a, a little bit pushing it. But you will have a, um, now a stream of the tweets from the news category showing as a screensaver like you know, type of experience. And you can just watch it. And it's obviously self-refreshing live, so it's very entertaining. You don't, uh, I, I, I personally spend a lot of time in it. It's very appropriate as well if you have like a, you know, a big screen, you put it on, and you just watch the news coming to you. It works very well with search, uh, of course. So we could search, uh, we could search, what should we search? Haiti, again. So this will be uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Twitter search, as you can see. And not that we are still logged out completely. We didn't you know, uh, input any or create any uh, username and password. And so same here, I can go back again to a TV mode, preview mode, with a tweet coming, it works full screen. If you're in a conference, uh, for example, you could uh, display the hashtag of a conference if you're a power user, and uh, that would be very cool. Um, so coming back to the interest directory, let me show you around a little bit. So again, uh, if you go now to celebrities, 
you have, say, Demi Moore uh, here. So watch, watch, this happens. It's her Twitter background. We didn't, you know, we just, you know, load it into the app. And uh, we have a number of celebrities in there. We have uh, Ashton Kutcher. Obviously, how could we not have Ashton? And, uh, and you, you can see his uh, Twitter background loading. I can also have in preview mode, in, um, in TV mode, the uh, tweets of just that user. So if you are a fan, if you're one of the uh, gazillion, what is it now, four million plus fans of fashion culture, same, you can have uh, his tweets showing, as you can see, they're, uh, they're coming uh, right now. Uh, and just those tweets, <laughs> if that's what you like. Oh, and we, we also like have a few, uh, you know, editorial choices, uh, such as uh, our friend Kevin here. Uh, we, we, we decided to put Kevin in celebrities. Not that the tweet, the white frog here, but we support, you know, the different pictures um, on, uh, on preview, on which preview in seismic loop without having to load them because my mother doesn't know what tweet pick, white frog, or tweet photo is. So what we did is we load the picture and uh, you can see it right in the app. And that's also something which we believe is very important, making extremely everything very, very, very simple. So we like to uh, see that Kevin is having a good lunch, uh, apparently very light, so he has the same problems. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the same uh, opportunities as me. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and so we, we really like the um, uh, browsing. It's, it's very, again, very game feeling. So opposed to, and I'm not saying power tools are not good, we love them, we'll keep innovating in them, but extremely different to using a tool. This is entertaining. Um, a tool has to, you know, you won't have keyboard shortcuts in there. You won't have, you know, hashtags. You will not have multiple account support. You will have all of those in all of the other seismic tools, not in Look, because we think they will never need that. So now what I can do is uh, I can still show you, a, you know, a few things. When you are on Paris Hilton here, if you, if you click, for example, <laughs> let's go into politics. <laughs> I just, you know, do randomly. So in politics, we have Davos here. Uh, we have also an events category, but if you take, oh, let's see what Ariana Huffington has to say. And uh, um, you can um, favorite, uh, you can see the user profile, and you can favorite the user. Same, you will say, but hey, I'm not logged in. So you can actually create your little short list of users for someone who just discovers the tool without needing to be logged in. We, we just store them locally. And, uh, and that's something we have uh, you know, decided to create based on focus groups and research we have done with those, uh, with, uh, those users who really want you know, something easy. And some of them might not logged in, and we hope they obviously grow up in their Twitter experience and create an account, which, uh, which gives me uh, an opportunity to show you that maybe you have noticed there is a Powered by Twitter logo on Seismic Look on the bottom left. And that um, Twitter logo is um, approved by Twitter, which we're very proud of. Um, and, uh, and we're really happy that uh, the, the entire Twitter team has, uh, has been helping us uh, design and, uh, and uh, integrate into Twitter to make that client possible, because obviously you need to work with Twitter, of course, to, to, make, you know, to make it uh, in terms of limits, in terms of experience. Again, this is logged out, so that's a very different experience. So Twitter is here, and we obviously want those new users to sign in and create Twitter accounts. So if you go back to uh, Trends, for example, again, um, and now you click here, you can see what's happening. Oh, do you have a Twitter account? And we will let, obviously we push uh, our users, our future users, to create an account on, um, on, uh, on Seismic Loop. Um, very soon we'll be able to create an account within Seismic Loop, and we're working with Twitter with that. So let me log in. Okay, so now I'm logged in. Um, you can see this avatar is a bit boring. I need to change it. But um, the, uh, now I'm logged in, so I can tweet. So hello, of course. 
from seismic look. I can uh, add a, uh, uh, I can, so we added all the features that you couldn't expect for your sister, for your, you know, your friends who don't, were not geeks, and we want them to have a full experience. However, of course, obviously, so you can add a link and it will, uh, you know, of course, shorten it. You can add a picture. Uh, in there and select it and uh, upload it, in this case to tweet photo. And, uh, or you can just tweet. So here, here we go. That's, um, that's what I've just done. Now, you can see on the left my timeline changed. So obviously we want the users who have Twitter accounts to have the best uh, possible experience and to, to be able to use it and, and learn all the very rich features that Twitter provides. And Seismic Look will keep innovating as much as uh, Twitter innovates. And we know Twitter has a lot of innovation coming our way. And uh, so obviously the inbox is there. Note the terms we took. It's called inbox. It's not called at replies. Same. We did that because my mother doesn't know what an at reply is. And we thought that inbox would be more appropriate. And of course, we will, uh, we will learn as we walk, and we will make the app evolve. And we want also your feedback and the feedback from your friends. Um, and, uh, and, and I can read my, uh, my different uh, at replies here. Um, so if my team is watching, which I think they are, I guess you can put Seismic Look online. So it's, uh, it should be available in a few minutes if it's not already. Uh, at seismic.com slash look and, uh, and you can try it for yourself. So I have my direct messages, which, uh, which, uh, which uh, I have, um, I can reply to that right in front of you if you like, you know. I am all about transparency. <laughs> Maybe this one? <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> well, you know, at least you can see it's all live. So yeah, I can, uh, <laughs> I can reply to that. Okay, let's take, uh, oh, Scobble. I was wrong to pitch this look for non-geeks. Display is very attractive. I might leave it running on the screen. That's Scobble. Uh, thank you, Robert, for reminding me that uh, I was wrong doing that. So uh, thanks, I'm glad you like it. So I can reply. I can add a picture, a link, you got that. I can see his profile. So here is Robert's profile. Now you see new buttons. You can, I'm already following Robert. You can unfollow him. You can favorite him. You can add him to a user list. We support entirely the new Twitter, new, not that new, right? In Twitter ecosystem time, a few weeks, see, it feels like two years. Um, but um, user list. And, um, and you can uh, direct message him. You can retweet him. So let me retweet him. Uh, this is the new retweeting, of course. Um, and uh, you can uh, uh, also see his own timeline. So just let go, let's go to that. And here is Robert's background. And if you're really a fan of Robert, you can even have his tweets showing up, you know, and like making you uh, uh, feel about it. Now, if I go in social, my friends, uh, <laughs> here's my wife, Shailene, saying hi. My friends are in the non-geek category, and, uh, and um, you have, um, uh, so here you have all the people you're following. This is just, just quote unquote, your timeline. And all your Twitter lists show up, uh, only if you're logged in, of course. So here I can go to, uh, uh, let's see, so I have a French timeline, uh, for example, the list. I can edit that list. I can. Uh, uh, add people and uh, and change change the list. <laughs> all right, so uh, my friend there is downloading it right now, and uh, and so on and so and so forth. And uh, you can so if you change your list here, it will change into Twitter. If you change it on Twitter, it will change it here. We want it to be, uh, of course, supporting all the, the features. So having said all that, that's you know seismic look, and we would love your feedback. There is one more thing before uh, I introduce you to uh, our partners or a few of our partners. One more thing. This is all touch enabled. And now I'm going to uh, show you. So I can actually do it on that computer. I am, uh, of course, I touched on the link. But here I am, uh, uh, close this. Here we go. I am navigating it with my uh, finger on the screen. 
So hint, this is going to be a very cool application for small touch devices such as tablets, for example. <laughs> or <laughs> it's probably a very good, uh, very good tool as well for devices like that, which are designed for your living room. And uh, that, uh, uh, that PC over here from our friends at uh, HP, it's called TouchSmart. And if I run Sysmic Look on it, you can see that I'm actually using it with a remote control. So this is not projected on screen, but now let me go to here. Um, you might want to zoom in, yeah. So now I'm navigating the timeline itself. So you see the pictures just with a remote control. And uh, I can do everything I've shown you with my mouse with a remote control. And I'm hoping uh, our friends at Microsoft solve very fast we, that we get rid of that as well. That, you know, we want, we want to just make gestures and, uh, and just move it like this with my hand. That's not available right now. But very soon I hear that they show, showed this at, at CES. It was very interesting. So sports, you know, that's, that's what I mean by a very near TV experience because you can be in your uh, couch sitting and enjoying uh, the sports category going into TV mode and uh, enjoying a very game-like experience, which is a first ever, and, uh, and we're, we're very proud of it. We will see how Luke is doing, but we think this is a new category that Sismic Luke is creating, and, uh, and we hope it's going to be our uh, avatar of uh, Twitter clients. Let's see how it goes. So with that, um, that's my uh, demo of uh, Sismic Look. Um, we have uh, something huge in it. Is, as I said, we wanted to, uh, to have the uh, um, consumers, the users, the mainstream users, be in, in an environment they trust. And there is not much, you know, there is something that they really trust is brands. You may, you may say what you, know, what you like about brands. I love a lot of brands and I love all of those here, but what we created is a, an opportunity for consumers to keep in touch with the brands they are fan of, and uh, if I can have uh, that screen back on, on the, on the, on the uh, main screen, and an opportunity, here we go, and an opportunity to, um, for the brands to actually get into that word of mouth and really uh, be in touch with this ecosystem of Twitter users. And honestly, if you look at it seriously, there isn't that many opportunities today. If you're a brand, it's extremely difficult to, you know, you can tweet, you can be, and we also advise all the brands and tell them to, 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 to be there, and many now are uh, interacting. But we think it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's very important that we offer them real estate and, uh, and a place that they can be featured. So I'm very happy and proud to, to announce uh, today that uh, with the launch of Sismic Look, we have three main, we have a number of partners, but we have three partners who are actually going to explain you what it means for them to, uh, be, to, to use Twitter for a brand and how they, and they will make the first demo of uh, Sismic Look channels. And so I would like to uh, uh, call uh, Kevin Duhan from uh, uh, from uh, Red Bull to join me on stage, Kevin, and uh, make a demo of the uh, Red Bull channel that we are so proud to have as a launch partner. Thank you. Kevin. I should have one of those. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Always. I'll get a Red Bull. The, uh, so let me, uh, at Red Bull, I'm in charge of basically anything you can click on. So social is part of that, but it could be video games, websites, etc. I've been at this for a long time. My first project was actually moving uh, the ERA real estate brand at Sending Corporation, moving it from Prodigy to the web. So it's pretty old school stuff. And this is one of the more impressive things that I've seen. Uh, the channels and the way the seismic is really making it easy for consumers to, to, uh, to consume tweets and kind of have a different experience. By the way, um, I, I'll go out on a limb here. I don't think Loic's mom is our target consumer. Um, but. I think she may be. She's welcome to drink as much Red Bull as, as she likes. The, uh, but I have heard from even many of our athletes, consumers, athletes, et cetera, that you know, Twitter, they're not into it. They don't understand exactly how it works. I think it's a great tool for all kinds of audiences to understand what's happening within Twitter. So 
what we wanted to do is really share uh, kind of the depth and breadth of the world of Red Bull. We're involved in so many sports. Uh, we have relationships with so many athletes. We wanted to service a lot of that content through a channel here on Seismic Look, and that's, that's what we've done. So just to take a really quick look at it, uh, you can see at the top here, uh, Lindsey Vaughn is asking her fans uh, which helmet uh, they like. And Lindsey is, is a big tweeter. There are a bunch of athletes in here who, uh, uh, who tweet a lot with Red Bull. If I take a look at her tweet, Oops, what is that? Oh, she posted it on Facebook. Just get back out here. So uh, there are several categories. You can look at uh, athletes, all of our athletes. Reggie Bush, big game coming up with uh, the Vikings. Go Saints. The, uh, uh, and Reggie is a prolific tweeter. So he does all these himself. He has a lot of stuff to say on Twitter. His follower base is growing really strongly. How many people know that Reggie is, is um, part of the Red Bull family? So really cool to be able to surface him you know, here in the application. Some other leaders, uh, Brian Vickers does a fair amount of tweeting, uh, one of our NASCAR drivers. In the background, what we tried to do is also show, again, the breadth of the world of Red Bull, different sports or culture activities that we're involved in. Uh, James Stewart, the current uh, super motocross champ, guy's absolutely amazing. And you can always get back to other areas as well. So we've broken up the uh, athletes in a lot of ways. Uh, it's kind of cool, these guys right here. We have pilots and the Red Bull Air Force. They're skydivers, base jumpers, et cetera. And all of them tweet. And they come up with some really cool photos that they drop into the channel in terms of uh, uh, when they're just about to go out of a plane or things like that. And then finally, the thing that I'll show here is uh, China Shop is a property the Red Bull has that features a lot of our culture content, so art, music, fashion, that type of stuff. And China Shop is a website. China Shop is uh, also um, a publisher of tweets. And here you can see that someone at China Shop is excited about the Coachella lineup. So we think this is a really cool interface. Um, a couple things, you know, one innovation is just seems, seems to me to be uh, something that's embraced at Red Bull. I think that the, the beverage itself is an innovation. So anytime we see something new, that's a great opportunity for us to kind of connect more closely with consumers. Uh, we're in on it. We want to experiment. We want to try it. And we thought this is really impressive. And then also, we think this is a really good opportunity just to show the kind of depth and breadth of the world of Red Bull. Thank you, Gary. Uh, just one question. What is your, uh, can you give us a few words about why is being on Twitter important for Red Bull. What's your idea behind it? Yeah, I think it's fairly natural. It's, it's really that consumers are talking about Red Bull there already. The Twitter, we have a Red Bull Twitter account. And uh, a consumer actually started that account. And you know, we took it over from the consumer in a super friendly way. The guy was a big fan. Uh, and now he's an even bigger fan. I may see him this afternoon. He's here in New York. Uh, but consumers are already talking about Red Bull. So it's a great opportunity for us to join the conversation. And so do you get in touch with them? Yeah, we absolutely do. And another thing I, that, I, that I like a lot on Twitter is we have the opportunity to amplify the consumer conversation. So there's a lot of things that I wouldn't necessarily say, or maybe the brand wouldn't necessarily say that consumers say. Then when we jump in and retweet that stuff and kind of share it around, we're really just giving a, a louder voice to things that consumers are already saying. I think that's unique to Twitter and something that we didn't have the opportunity to do that before. And yeah, and it gives me an opportunity to explain that this is extremely flexible as a partner. You, you have full control, obviously, on the background you choose. As Kevin uh, demonstrated, if you go into uh, uh, any of the, let's go to the air. Uh, <laughs> um, and so you can change, obviously, the avatar, the picture of any of the users. You can uh, uh, do it. And, uh, and, and this is all obviously on the server side. So it doesn't, we don't have to uh, you know, upload and re, I'm sorry, upgrade, and you don't have to download anything. It's going to be live and, and change. So do you, do you plan to integrate consumers in there, like the big fans of, of Red Bull as well? Uh, I'm, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure I could say that now. I think we'll integrate some more Red Bull tweets. Uh, right now, this is super, super athlete and kind of relationship focused. Uh, We'll and we're keep the conversation going with consumers, and we'll see what's right. Yeah. And we're experimenting together, and we're really, really happy uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm thrilled by the app. I think it's the coolest thing ever. And all the stuff that you showed, it's just, it's really um, an interesting new way to consume tweets. And I think Twitter's, it's so, uh, it's so valuable and addicting. <laughs> and I think the beginning of uh, understanding it is really consuming tweets. And you've made it real easy in Seismic Look. Thank you very much, right, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Kevin Excuse will be me. around. Um, Kevin will be around if you, uh, if you have uh, uh, questions and uh, if you want to, to meet him, because what they do is one of the most advanced brands, and what they do is, is really interesting. So back to channels. Um, if you go back to channels, you can see this screen where also we can you know, update it very easily. And uh, we, don't, we not only have um, consumer brands, we also have media, as you can see here. And we have a few launch partners, and one of them is the Huffington Post, who has you know, you know, blown my mind on how fast uh, they uh, embraced Sismic Look and, and agreed to be here with us uh, today. So I would like to uh, um, have uh, Josh Young join me on stage, Josh from the Huffington Post, and uh, explain uh, uh, to us what, what the huge strategy of the uh, Huffington Post is with, uh, with Twitter. I mean, you've, you've not waited for Sismic Look to be on Twitter, but uh, I would love to have some thoughts about, about this meet Luke. Thank you. Um, so I probably don't need to tell this audience much more uh, what the internet is doing uh, in terms of changing how people communicate with brands. It's also changing how people relate to the news. There was once a time when the basic interaction between news and readers was just readership. And now that's changing so that readers are connecting not just up to brands, but across to each other. So they're sharing the news between one another, and I don't just mean that they're cutting out clips and sending it to their son. Um, they send links. They send links through email and IM. They also react to the news. They react to the news by tweeting about it, by tweeting a link and adding an opinion. Um, they also are getting into the narrative. One of the things that we're really focused on at the Huffington Post is figuring out ways where we can bring our community into the news itself. So one of our projects now um, is called a, a Move Your Money project. And the idea is that uh, people may like to move their accounts, which may be in very big banks, too big to fail banks perhaps, to community banks. And Twitter, it turns out, and Facebook as well, is a wonderful place to have that project exist. So, um, because people, there's a hashtag, you move your money, on every single piece of content where we write about the story and we keep the narrative alive, we have people who are interacting with um, the story. And so they say they can take a pledge, say, I'm going to move my money, or they can um, upload a video and tweet it about how they did move their money. Um, so we're really excited about that from a news perspective, so that it's not just a one-way dialogue from media company to reader, but from one user just to another user. The news may originate with us most of the time, but it doesn't have to. We take tips. Uh, we have an army of citizen journalists across the country. And, and this is a big part of that. We're really excited about this because we can easily get to a whole new layer, a whole new sort of broader audience who will get Twitter all over again. So with that, let me walk through some of the fun stuff we have here. So um, we've got a number of categories. Uh, let me take you into our politics category now. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about with Seismic Look is um, to be a little bit uh, geeky at the moment, is that it interposes a uh, category level between something like a, like a brand or a newspaper or an internet newspaper and the accounts themselves. So users can focus not just on um, their entire timeline, but something that's sort of analogous to a list, a Twitter list. So it's very fun for us to say, here is our presence in politics. Um, so we have our accounts that correspond to our sections. So if you really want to dive into our politics, you can do that. Um, let's see here. 
Nico Pitney is a wonderful guy, um, our national news editor, and a wonderful tweeter. Um, he was um, all over putting together our first list of tweeters about Haiti. So like I was sleeping um, and Nico was around and awake when um, the earthquake first happened in uh, Haiti and immediately put together this list. So he's so good. He's one of like our amazing, just sort of natural tweeters. Um, someone I absolutely do not need to train. Um, I'm pretty excited about including our HuffPost Citizen Journalism account uh, in Seismic Look. We have uh, editors dedicated to reaching out to citizens to report on anything from Tea Party protests to um, art openings in New York City. And this happens across the country. Um, so this is fun. Um, users of Seismic Look can come here and see how people who are basically like them, normal people, interested in telling others in the world about what's going on in their world, are writing about. So let me show you others of ours. Uh, let's do our tech and social media one. So again, I'm really excited about how we have a mix of our accounts. So we have our HuffPost tech, and that's just really interesting links to our own articles and to other articles. Um, we, this is Jose Antonio Vargas, is our wonderful technology editor. Um, there's me. Um, Paul Berry is our CTO at the Huffington Post, a wonderful CTO who's got a, actually an amazing presence on Twitter. He's sort of, he's a bit new to Twitter within, within the last year or so. Um, but he's just in a really engaging personality on Twitter. And one of the things I like about categories is that we can put uh, the Huffington Post tech main account with, that's mostly links to content in a space where we also have our editors who are just people. Um, I don't remember what I was tweeting about yesterday, so I'm, I'm worried that I might have been uh, uh, a little too fresh. Um, here's another great example. I'm really happy with what we did with our business category. So again, we've got our main account here. We've got our, uh, our two business editors. Shaheen is a wonderful business reporter. Uh, we actually just had the privilege of sitting down with Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel laureate in economics the other day. Um, so there's like wonderful tweets about um, that experience from them over the last couple of days. Eric Hippo, uh, our CEO, is always fun to follow on Twitter. Um, if you want to know about our latest Comscore numbers, Eric Hippo is always the guy to go to. Uh, and at the same time, we can do this interesting integration with Move Your Money. So we've got our, our Move Your Money. Um, Twitter account as well. Um, and all of this, again, lives in, in this business category. So anyway, I think that's a pretty good, a pretty good run through of our accounts. We really, really like how we can put together our vertical accounts and our editors in the same experience and have users follow that. Thank you very much. Uh, and before you leave, uh, yeah. uh, Josh, we have, um, so obviously we let them edit the channel and customize it as much as, uh, as they like. Again, this is all server-based, but what we do as well is we integrate some of that content into the uh, interest directory, which we have here. So if you go, for example, in uh, politics, you will see that Ariana Huffington is here. Um, you will uh, find the uh, uh, Huffington Post in the news as well. So the channels can have, obviously, links uh, in, in, throughout the app. We can also, we're not doing it, but we can also you know, display a few Huffington Post tweets in the trends. Mm -hmm. This is just a beginning, of course. And we're very thrilled to uh, have you uh, on board. Uh, That's Josh. right. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Um, so, brands, media. Thank you, Josh. Big fan of the Huffington Post. Um, and, uh, and so there is also, in, uh, in how brands interact with, uh, with Twitter, there is a lot of, uh, of course, you know, there are brands who, who really have a lot of, users and, and, and community 
people behind um, behind uh, behind the brand, behind Twitter. What I what I really like is, of course, when you can talk to a brand, whether you have positive comments, sometimes negative comments. I can experiment that myself, of course. And so we're very very proud to announce that we also have as a launch partner uh, Kodak. Uh, you know that little consumer brand. And uh, and I'm thrilled to have with us uh, Jennifer Cisney, who is. Uh, uh, master community at uh, at Kodak with uh, with our team answering a lot, an, an amazing number of uh, of, um, of of tweets and interacting all day. And so I would like Jennifer to present our channel on Seismic Look. And again, also what I want to say is that we put this together like in a matter of days. And been so like brands are generally you know not always not always responsive and so on. You've been amazing. So Jennifer, thanks, thank Louis. you for joining us. So everyone at Kodak is really excited about being involved with Seismic Look. Uh, Kodak obviously is all about sharing and connecting, and we think Seismic Look is a really fun, interactive way to do that. Uh, we're also at Kodak really into social media, and um, we're always ready to take the next step. We started our first blog in 2006, I was shortly after that named Kodak Chief Blogger. Uh, and even this summer, we uh, chose the name of one of our new pocket video cameras by taking suggestions through Twitter. Uh, we ended up actually choosing two names, uh, Play and Sport, to combine into one name, the Play Sport. So uh, we were really excited to uh, be involved with Seismic Look. So let's take a peek here at the Kodak channel. Uh, the first category being tweets from people at Kodak. Uh, definitely, we want to put faces with our brand, uh, whether it's, um, I'm on here, I'm Kodak CB. Uh, people know me by that name, Kodak CB. They find me at trade shows and ask for Kodak CB. Uh, our CMO, Jeff Hazlett, is really into Twitter. He's uh, always talking about Twitter at, at, at conferences. He's very involved. Um, and we, you know, we, we do still, you know, we want to sell our products, so we have our Kodak deals where you can find all the latest uh, specials and sales. Uh, but then, you know, getting back to the people, we have a Kodak Gallery. We have Gavin here who's uh, out on the West Coast with our Kodak Gallery team. Just talking about... Uh, talking about our products, connecting with customers. We're there to answer questions about our products. If somebody uh, loses a power cable to a camera, we're there to help them find those answers. So it's not all about just what, have, what Kodak has to say, of course. Uh, we've created a category for photography. And we have just people that tweet that we think are experts in the industry that have interesting things to say about the topic, like Photo Jojo. They're always having, coming up with really fun, creative, innovative ways to use photography. Uh, New York Times Photo, we, we love the, the photo galleries that they put up and the, the photo stories. Um, Rick Salmon, who is a, a well-known pro photographer, we included him. Uh, so you can go here and just in one click find all these, these people that are experts in the industry and have really interesting things to say about photography. Now because we have our pocket video cameras, which are really popular right now, we've also included a digital video category uh, with users like Steve Garfield, uh, he's very active online with digital online video. Uh, across the pond there, we've got iFrans uh, over in Germany who's uh, a fan of our pocket video cameras but is always doing innovative things online. And, uh, you know, even and then New York Times video. So it's, we're, we really want to share what other people have to say about the different industries, not just what, what Kodak wants to talk about. So that's pretty much it. We're, we're really excited and we're thrilled to be part of this. And it's, uh, it's such a visual application. We, we love that. Thank you, Jennifer. And can you tell me a few words on how you interact with uh, like the consumers? It can be pretty hard sometimes. Huh? Yeah. Um, you know, and we're, we're really transparent. Uh, I wasn't just hired into the company to do this. I've been with Kodak for 12 years. So I know the business really well. So if somebody 
drops their camera in a puddle and they don't know what to do. I know who to go to to get an answer for them. So we want to be there for them and we want to hear their feedback, whether it's good or bad, because in the end, that's going to make Kodak a better product. But the, like someone really hard, you know, trying to like, oh, it's Kodak, you know, like I get that with Sysmic often and sometimes it's at 2 a.m., you know, I go and I answer myself. Like, it's, yeah. is it not difficult like in big, comp large company like you, this too? You do have to grow a tough skin because you aren't going to please everyone all the time. But I have been pleasantly surprised when somebody comes to me and I answer them just as Jenny at Kodak, not just this big corporate entity. And they usually, I can see the, the emotions come down and be like, oh, okay. Uh, uh, and and it, they, they totally back off a little bit because I am a, I'm a real person and uh, they recognize that. Very good. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Great Kodak channel. So. A few, you know, just one thing I'd like to show you before uh, and before we 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 close with a uh, with a, a very interesting keynote with someone you all know. Um, I just want to show you. So we have obviously other uh, launch partners, as you can see. We have also um, uh, Life here. Um, we have uh, Time, and uh, uh, I just wanted to. Uh, to show here also uh, the Summit on the Summit, which is a non-profit, and uh, we're really happy to have them as, a, as launch partner. Very interesting and, and also beautifully designed uh, uh, channel. And uh, in, the, um, in, in the app itself, if you go to uh, Interest, you will also find a, a charity uh, category that uh, actually I, I collected thanks to your help. I just tweeted, you know, who should be listed in there, and uh, many, many uh, replies um, uh, from, like, for example, Steve Case, who told me, hey, I, I have a list of uh, charities you might want to have a look. So, uh, and his foundation is here as well. But you can see the, the, uh, this, this category. So if you want to help, uh, feel free to browse and discover here. As we are been building and we'll update this directory, we, we discovered so many uh, uh, Twitter accounts. And, uh, and uh, of course, in terms of charity, the pictures take another uh, dimension. Um, here. And uh, very interesting two events which will uh, keep moving. And so here we listed a few events, two coming, upcoming events, World Economic Forum in Davos or, or TED uh, with uh, infamous uh, TED Talks which, uh, which are uh, heavily retweeted. And uh, just to finish with, in, if you go to settings, you can see I have two themes here available. I, sh I showed you the default theme which is the dark theme and uh, blue, and you can go into, uh, oh, was, it, was I on, uh, the yes. So let's go into the, the, the light. I forgot which one I did. So let me show you. So here is the dark one. So now we're changing, yeah, I was on the old one. So now we're changing the theme of the app. Now we're in dark mode. And uh, Sysmic Look has been designed to support a number of, uh, of themes. So expect us to create more themes, obviously. And uh, we actually opt to open it as well to our outside uh, creative design. But also, it's been designed to be customized for brands, for example, or for media. So think about, for example, the Huffington Post Twitter application. You know, just a hint, it's something that, uh, that, uh, that I'm, I'm not announcing, but that uh, is, is something that we, we can do. And if uh, you're interested in talk talking to us to be in Sismic Look, we'll be happy to, uh, to, to meet you. With that, this is uh, Luke. I, I know some of you have already downloaded it. I hope you like it. And it's just the beginning. We'll keep improving it. You have been used with Sysmic that we push updates quite regularly, and we hear the feedback, and also, also when it's you know not uh, when it's suggestions to improve. And uh, I would like to thank again Microsoft for being such an awesome partner, helping us you know build and also get in touch with brands, putting this event together in a in a few days. So Daryl. Uh, the, I would like to, well, first, thank you, and have, have you keep going with the event? Well, th thank you, and thank you for the innovation again. I, I, as I said in the beginning, uh, we're pretty well convinced this is a tremendous innovation, and we're super proud to be a partner of, of Seismic uh, as they do this. Uh, for now, I want to be sure that we, we offer the, the right amount of time and respect for our, our last speaker. Uh, I want to welcome on stage uh, Steve Rebell who is VP uh, at Edelman Digital, Edelman Digital, pardon me. Steve? How Thanks are you? for joining us, appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. So thank you all for having me here today. Um, what I want to talk about is one of the trends. So my job 
at Edelman is to, you know, not so much focus on the technologies. The technologies are a lot of fun. But it's to think about what the major trends are that are reshaping how we think, how we act, how we buy, how we get news, and to help our large clients, uh, everyone from HP to Microsoft to Unilever uh, to Starbucks, pivot into those trends early uh, with the understanding that that, 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 you know, that is going to be how they need to communicate going forward. We're excited about Seismic Look um, because we think it underscores a current need out there and that the, the web is moving from a web of pages to a web of streams. Now, power users know that. Power users know that. But we, we're excited about Seismic Look and other venues like it because what it does is it exposes to a broader audience of consumers this whole notion of, of content that comes to you in streams and branded channels. And so I want to talk about what I think the trends are and, and how we're advising brands to, uh, to begin to tap into opportunities like Seismic Look and others that are out there. So the challenge that everyone is going to face, everyone, is this, the fire hose. More information was created in 2009 than all, of man, and all the history of mankind before 2009 according to Amazon.com's former chief scientist. So information is going to scale. And this is where curation is going to play a wonderful role in helping us separate art from junk. You go to the great museums here of New York City, and my finger paintings are not there. Um, but there are works of art there that somebody decided should be there. So curation is big, and seismic look is a form of curation. Brands can and should be digital curators in the niches that they care about. And I think you, the examples you just saw are that. So the fire hose is going to be a challenge for us. And you all know this from your own life. But the more socially media, social media adept you are, the more this is pronounced. This is a screenshot of somebody's um, uh, inbox on one day. And you can see that uh, they have 2,000 Gmails, 530 RSS items, 7,000 corporate emails. Uh, I think Loic has like 10 times this. Um, all these Facebook requests. I think this is a global problem. There's an attention crash in the world. The, and uh, human attention is finite. And even for the average mom who gets, you know, maybe 100 emails a day, 50 emails a day, 10 emails a day, there's still SMSs, there's still uh, Facebook posts, there's still lots of information coming at us. Uh, and I, but I think that, you know, the more that you are become engaged in these channels, the more you realize it's, it's, it's a problem. And, there was a Mark Dazol Red Day. Did anybody here celebrate Mark Dazol Red Day? Uh, or you may have heard of, uh, I'm sure those of you who are journalists would love this, um, email bankruptcy, um, which is where you take all your emails out of your inbox and you just delete them. Um, and you figure if it's really important, somebody will contact you again. Um, that's something that we're seeing some people do. So, and there's a hierarchy of digital distractions. This is hard to read. But all of us are going to have to make choices as content becomes much more of a stream and we don't navigate from page to page any page anymore. Things just kind of come at us pouring. We're all going to have to decide what distractions we let into our lives and when. So at the top of the digital pyramid here, that this is at informationisbeautiful.net, is device failure. When your iPhone, your Blackberry, your Palm, you know, your computer fails, it gets your attention right away. At the bottom is any kind of actual work. Um, and when it's actual work, we don't want to do it. So this pyramid's going to scale. This pyramid's going to scale, and we're going to have to make choices. And mobile makes it worse, not better. Mobile makes things much more compact. Uh, it's short attention span theater. Um, we have, I mean, I know what's on my phone right now. I got, you know, three movies. I got my, my tweets. I got Facebook. I got my email. I got, you know, 100 articles I want to read. Everyone is going to make choices, plus there's some really good games, too. We're going to have to make choices about what we consume. Mobile is just going to make this shorter, et cetera. This is where curation is a big deal. This is why I'm enthusiastic about Twitter lists and things like that. And Seismic Look on the desktop brings curation to you in a very, very powerful way. And I think it is one of the number of different services that we will see emerge uh, in the coming few years. So that's the challenge is the fire hose and the amount of information that we have dealing with it coming at us all at once. There's no solution. I mean, yes, there's curation and applications that will help us there. But the solution is really with us. 
Each of us is going to have to make choices about what we consume and when. Friends will trump everything else other than things you have to do like for survival or, to, or to, for a living. But friends will trump everything else. And we're seeing this already in the data about how people are making choices. This number is not my age, but this is the average number of domains that an American visits in one month, according to Nielsen. So the average Joe or Jane visits 111 domains a month. In other countries around the world, it's even lower. It's under 100 domains. When you think about the number of web pages this amounts to, it's about 2,500 in the United States. Now, that might sound like a large number, but it really isn't. If you think about how many emails you get of, check out this link, or did you see this, or did you hear about this, and you visit a site that you normally never go to, you know, the bbc.com, or you go to financialtimes.com, or you go to newyorktimes.com, and you're not a regular reader of that, of that publication. That counts in this stream. If you go to Twitter 10 times a day, it also counts as part of this stream. So we're all making choices. I believe that people are becoming media agnostic. Now, if you're in the media business, I'm sorry. But they're becoming media agnostic. What does that mean? Well, we're making choices. And there might be, like for me, I, if I go a morning without reading the New York Times, I don't feel like I'm a human being. But everything else is passed to me through the stream. Haiti, I hear about through the stream. The news finds me. I don't find the news. Unless I want to go down deep into a subject and I need to know more about that. This is a problem. And Seismic Look and other applications, Twitter lists and so forth, help solve that by surfacing high-value information, high-value content. And I love that Kodak is curating. I love that they're not saying, we're not just showing you what is about us, but we're curating content around high value information. So this is going to be a problem. Media agnosticism is going to be a problem, too. And it's becoming much more of a snack-like metaphor. I mean, long-form content, I think you know, books and things like that, people will go down deep when they're interested. But everything else is just going to be you know, snack, snack all day long. And, and this is why I think Twitter and Facebook have taken off, because there's this snacking kind of culture that we live in now. Um, and it is all real time. It's real time. Uh, when I was at uh, the LeWeb conference uh, last month, uh, Queen Rania summed it up best from Jordan when she said, real time is the new prime time. So what does that mean for brands? If you're not engaged in real time, you will not be heard. You will not be considered. You need to be on and be on all the time. And the brands that are on Twitter that we work with know that. They know they need to be on all the time because real time is the new prime time. At the same time, though, our own data from the Edelman Trust Barometer, which comes out every year, and the new data will be out in a couple of weeks, we have found that people need to hear things three to five times before they act. So in the age of streams, that's a challenge. A single tweet is not going to do it. A single media impression is not going to do it. An article in a high-value publication is not going to do it. You need to be in front of people three to five times and increasingly from three to five different sources. People want to hear from regular employees, not just the brand. They don't want to necessarily hear just from executives. They want to hear from people who will listen to them, accept their feedback, and, and channel what they heard, as Kodak just talked about, as, as HP and RIM and Microsoft and lots of other brands are doing on Twitter and Facebook uh, as two key venues. Um, and so that's key. But at the same time, surfacing that information is going to be harder. And this is where curation plays a role. So in the age of streams, we're advising our clients that there are three strategies they need to think about. Three strategies they need to think about. The first is you have to be ubiquitous. I, I don't have an easy way to address that. Um, you have to figure out which communities your customers are spending time in, and then you need to be omnipresent in those communities with high value information and resources. Um, the way you do that is by building out digital embassies in all the communities that matter. Right now, there's arguably three to four communities that matter. Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube. 
Um, and I think for some, LinkedIn. Google is kind of connective tissue that runs across all those. Um, in a year, it could be different. A year ago, we were talking about MySpace and Second Life being very prominent, or two years ago. So it changes. It changes. But the whole notion of having an embassy is relevant. You go to Washington and his embassy row, and the ambassador there from, uh, from the UK is thinking about what does the United States want from us, and what do we want from the United States, and we think about shared mutual gain, and we, our embassy is a starting point where we make that happen. Same model works in social spaces, and increasingly to some degree in media spaces, although there's church state uh, rules that we need to think about there. So building out digital embassies in Twitter is great, and seeing them surface through things like seismic look is even better. And having an opportunity to take that presence and expand it and magnify it is a, is a great opportunity that we think brands should be taking advantage of. Second thing is you need to have multiplicity and diversity of message. You can't take the same message and run it through every channel. The people on Facebook have a different MO than the people on Twitter and the people on YouTube. Now, it might be the same person, but there's, there's multiple modalities there. So you need to think about how the content that you create and the conversation that you participate, how you shape that depending on the venue. Like him or hate him, one person who does this very well is the White House, the Obama administration. It's no longer a message of the day approach there. What they do is they tell one story in Twitter, they tell a different story on Nightline, they tell a different story to the New York Times, and the topics vary. It could be long form content in one place, short form in another, conversational in some, uh, more static in others. And they blanket all these different spaces with multiple stories in multiple spaces on the same day. You ensure there that way that people who are interested in what you have to say are engaged with you in those communities. So you don't treat any two venues the same way and you, and you diversify how you talk. That's something that brands need to do and they need to do it on Twitter. That's why having multiple people on Twitter is, is a very valuable thing because if somebody's a go-to expert in one area, you can have that person focus there. And if somebody's a go-to expert in another area, you can focus there. It's a good way to spread the balls around. Finally, we're telling folks, use the force. Don't fight it. I always look for an excuse to put Yoda in a presentation. I don't know. Um, it works well in geek conferences. I don't know about others. Um, and what I mean by that is lots of companies are blocking Twitter and Facebook. Okay? It reminds me of the final days of communism. Okay, Mr. CIO, tear down this wall. I'm not Reagan. But, uh, but you get the idea. Okay? It's going to come in no matter what. People have, I mean, I'm carrying right now in my, in my pocket two smartphones. I don't view them as smartphones. They're pocket computers. They're my social networks that are with me everywhere. People are going to want to be engaged in social networks. More business is going to take place through social networks. I know that now when I'm interviewed by reporters, um, they'll set up Facebook groups. And they'll say, come in and talk to us there. They'll use Google Wave to do an interview. Uh, and, they'll, and if you say, well, it's blocked, they don't want to hear from you. Business is going to transact through social networks, at least initially. That will be an initial point of contact. So what I'm telling our, our clients is put things like Seismic on your intranet, connect it to your intranet. Okay? Think of, of Facebook and Twitter as catnip. Catnip to get your messages across. So connect employee engagement and digital engagement in a very powerful way. Use the force. Don't fight the force. You will lose. And so that's what we think marketers need to do in communicating the age of streams. Seismic look is, is one great way to do that. We think there will be others. But again, this whole notion of curation uh, in, in, a, in a pile of content and a lot of noise and surfacing high value information is something that we as individuals are going to have to do. But having tools to make that available to us and bring it to the masses is even more exciting. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Wow. So big day, big morning. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining. The folks who could join us in person, thank you so much for making the time and uh, coming down. For folks who are on the webcast, uh, I know there are a lot of you. We appreciate you uh, joining us uh, virtually. 
thousands, uh, I'm now told by Louis. Thank you for joining us, all thousands of you, uh, uh, and joining us virtually. We very much appreciate it. Trending on Twitter. Hey, trending on Twitter. Who, if anyone here hasn't already tweeted, you must tweet now. Uh, but thank you so very much for everyone who joined us in person, everyone who's on the webcast, uh, for uh, Loic and his team uh, for unveiling here and allowing us to sort of present this to you, the Advertising Age folks for co-sponsoring with us. Also want to thank the speakers that uh, Loic had joined uh, him as well, uh, Kevin, Jennifer, and Josh. Uh, and with that, we will actually, uh, for the folks who are here in person, as a thank you, we are providing lunch for you uh, up in the foyer. For the folks who are online, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Next, next time when Loic asks you to come down, maybe you'll come down. Uh, we can feed you lunch. Uh, but, but thank you so very much for joining us. Thanks. <laughs>